Good morning, everybody. It's Friday. Friday of, a, of another big week. RP. Huge week. Nice to see you. Huge week. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you on that. You know what we're going to do? We're going to start the way we do as, as always. RP, RP, you know what I want to do, uh, if we could, I, I wanted to start off, if, if you're up for it, with a conversation about the show itself. Okay. Okay, and, I'll, and, and I'll, I'll give you an intro, which may give you a sense of why I want to start that way. And it is, um, we're at this moment, right? This, and, and I think that the good news is I hear a lot of, like, it's time for us to bridge the divide, right? I hear that a lot. Um, and so I want to think about how to bridge the divide and be honest about how that might work. And included within that is outlining the challenges that go along with that. And as an example, um, it is the media's job, unfortunately, to make money. That's their job. They, they want to make money. And, and to their credit, many of them particularly the newspapers, um, but TV too, you know, was it's, it's very existence was, was threatened with the papers. I mean, the papers were hit hard by the onslaught of the internet. They've made a comeback. Subscriptions have started to work and their business models are a little stronger than they were say five, 10 years ago. Um, you know, TV, that's less true. I mean, they, you know, Fox nets a billion dollars a year. MSNBC is very profitable. Um, but the way it works is that they know for a fact that when they say the nice thing, it's not going to do as well as when they say the extreme thing. It's not going to do as well when they say the salacious thing. It's not going to do as well when they instill a little fear. And they now know that on a scientific level because the Internet tells them that. They can watch interest grow when they share the dramatic, when they share the divisive, and they'll watch interest wane when they do the opposite. Okay. I, and, you know, you may not like that. You may think that they have an ethical responsibility to know that and just do the right thing every time. I think that's unrealistic, certainly to a point anyway. And the way that that relates is because I, too, am one of the people who hopes very energetically that we can bridge the gap that we can find each other's hearts that we can come together um and i hope that in our tiny way this show can help do that so the first example i gave of, as one of the challenges was the media challenge and part of what i hope we can accomplish with this show is to be a media because it's kind of what we've become with this show a media organization that tries to forgo that, that, go, that looks past that and does something that's better. So you can comment on any of that. I mean, as I, at the top, I said I wanted to talk a little bit about this show, and I do, but I also want to talk about that topic. Bridging the divide has actually been a goal of every great U.S. president in our lifetime. Um, probably a goal of so many great leaders, for-profit, not-for-profit government in our lifetimes, just recognizing that the great experiment of America is a pretty fragile fabric. And media, I couldn't agree with you more. <clears throat> you know, we, we all know we went from three major news stations and maybe five, nor five newspapers across the country that were, that had a different set of motivations than they have now, right? So yes, the motivations now are profit motive and the hatred, amplif ha the hatred amplifier pays. And this terrifying amplifier pays. So we're, we're aligned on that problem. And then are we part of the solution? Well, hopefully the first let's not be part of the problem. And, you know, you and I had a conversation about during the election, were we, were we trying to be fact driven and not partisan? And we certainly tried. I hope we were successful in doing so. Um, we certainly weren't partisan for partisanship, partisanship's sake. That's for sure. So, um, 
Yeah, I mean, it, whatever it is we're doing, we're doing pretty small, but I think it has a really high impact on some people, and that gives me a lot of psychic benefit. It's valuable for me just to talk with you and get my thoughts together and all the great guests we have on. And um, and we're obviously not making any money on it, so maybe we can avoid the, uh, the hatred amplification of for-profit media. So, so far, so good. Yeah. Okay, and so within that, if you were going to think about... Um I'll use an example. I, I was with a friend of mine yesterday who's an older woman um, who very much sees where we are as, I'm going to say, the Trump narrative. Now, she will say that she thinks Trump isn't the greatest guy, um, but she does believe in her heart that the election was, to a certain extent, rigged to the best of my knowledge, and it is my position that I disagree with her, right? I, and I told her that. Um, you know, she's, she's of Eastern European descent, and um, her family, her experience is that the freedom of America is really important, and that uh, Joe Biden's going to walk us more towards a socialist borderline communist. These are her words, not mine. Anyway, you're getting a sense of sort of her view of the world. And, um, and I, you know, I can honor that. I don't think she's a bad person. I don't, I don't think she, I think she, she takes Trump as a warts and all kind of situation because it's a better path to a freer country. And it is her belief that some of the election was rigged. Um, because she thinks of like the democratic machine. Like that's how she thinks about it. And to add to that, she said, we are being asked to just accept it and move on when, you know, she'll say, you know, people will say that George W. Bush is still an illegitimate president because of the election of 2000, that, um, you know, the Mueller investigation was all about questioning the outcome of the last election because of Russian interference, et cetera, et cetera. And that why would they ask us just to move on when they couldn't just move on? All right. Again, I'm not taking any side in, in, in this, in, in that, in the way I laid that out, but I am, I, I did want to outline her philosophy and her sets of beliefs. And even though I don't see it exactly the way she sees it, it's not shocking to me that she gets there. Okay. Yeah. So, my- um, Sorry, go ahead. And last point, and you, I want you to go. And therefore, I don't dislike her, or I don't think she's bad, and I don't want to argue with her per se, but I did say to her, I said, I actually disagree with you on a number of points, but I guess I can understand how you got there in your thinking. But go ahead. So my instinct, and those, you know, you know me, and those of the people who know me know my instinct right now is to like, go to a fact-based narrative about why the points of view, what I agree with from her point of view and what I don't, and here's the facts to back it up. And that's probably not helpful. And the the fact that she reached out to you and had this conversation with you, which we know in many instances is a pretty intimate conversation. People are exposing themselves sometimes having these conversations is because of this first predicate thing for all this healing to begin, which is trust. So she trusts you. And the way you're describing her she should, right? You're describing her with empathy, with heart. You're, you're working hard to understand how she got to where she did. You may disagree with some of, she's, some of what she said, but you are responding in the way she thought she would, you would respond, thereby you continue to earn that trust. And that's what's first necessary. And we just don't have trust in this country anymore. And, and I don't, you know, we, again, we can go into all the facts about, oh, you know, 0.0007, ballots actually have ever been fraudulent and we can go on and on about all that. And and it's probably worth doing a little of that, but it's all just going to bounce. It's all going to be met by deaf ears if there isn't trust. So, so she can have that conversation with you, but if she turned on MSNBC, she wouldn't absorb any of it. I presume, right? Much like if someone on the other side turned on Fox, they wouldn't absorb any of that either. But half the country, the other half of the country does to you, right? Which is crazy. So we have to rebuild the trust. And, and I believe, 
I have a very optimistic belief. We've been under so much psychic strain, and I don't care if you're Republican or Democrat. You know, you mentioned some of it, right? We have an FBI investigation of an incoming president. We have a president who begins with one of his first press conferences, just giving a point of view on the size of his audience that we know is not true. The largest inaugural address ever. And was like, well, it wasn't, right? And then we have, you know, the the House going after him, the Mueller investigation and uh, an impeachment. The list goes on and on and on. Then we have a pandemic. Then we have the George Floyd pro- murder and protest. Like, we have been under so much divisive stress. Acid has been poured on our relationships from every angle. And the hatred amplifier of the media has been making profit off of this, right? So we know that. The trust is gone. We don't have shared facts anymore. And and just like, you ask her, hey, how many ballots do you think were rigged? Or give me an example of a fact that leads you to this conclusion. And she will present, I'm obviously using her as an example now. She will present something, I don't know. She will present something that she believes a fact that will probably be opposite than someone who watches MSNBC believes to be a fact. Right. So we don't have facts. We don't have trust. I'm very optimistic that that's going to all get better. And maybe I am just being I'm fooling myself. But I believe when you stop banging your head against the curb, you start seeing things much more clearly. Everyone has a plan till they get punched in the face. We got punched in the face over and over. I don't care what side of the aisle you're on. This has been a divisive, horrendous four and a half years. If you like Trump, then you watched him get attacked unendingly from organs of, govern- organs of government and from the media. If you didn't like Trump, you felt like you were under massive attack by your own president. You were being ignored and abused by your own president. And I'm hoping that all slowly comes to an end. We're not there yet. We've got till January 20th. The president's gonna keep us in suspense for a long time. Um, we're not at the point yet when the pressure's off and our head isn't beating against the curb. But when it gets there, I think we're going to be able to breathe more of a sigh of relief. And a lot of these things are just going to get a little less poignant, a little less poignant. And then we get back to, you know, without being screamed and yelled at, without yelling and screaming at each other, then we can begin to maybe understand some realities. Last point. I've gone on for a while. Last point. Is there 15% of the country on each side that will never be there? Yes. 15% of far left Democrats, let's call them. 15% of far right Republicans, let's call them, they're not going to get there. But is there 70% of America that can begin to really move beyond the hatred amplification machine of media, move towards some shared facts, move towards this process of healing? I think in the right environment, there certainly is. And I believe we're going to get there. So your conversation with her in three months might be, and this is part of what I'm beginning to tee up with people now is write down how concerned and how afraid you are now. So for Republicans, it's, you know, basically the the narrative that you and I are hearing is Kamala Harris is a communist who is just laying in wait for a sclerotic Biden to die. And then she and AOC and Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren are going to take over the government where become socialist and communist. And you're concerned about that. And I understand why that would be something we'd be afraid of. So note that now. And what evidence would make that appear more and more true? And what evidence would make that appear less and less true? And start watching for those things and seeing what media you're looking at. And is it opinion or is it fact? And I see, of course, here's where I am. I ended up back at fact while fully acknowledging fact isn't what we're ready for yet. Yeah, it's um, one of the ways I think about it, which, by the way, she did add that note of Kamala Harris is going to take over. Now, I don't even know what the story is. Biden going to die? Is that what we're saying? Is, yeah, is, Biden is has got she... Alzheimer's and he's just propped up on drugs and electronics or something right now. And, and as soon as, you know, they let the air out of his tire, then the socialists move in. Well, so I think one of the ways of thinking about this, and I'm just going to read you a headline, and it is from CNN, and it does have a particular bias, but this is the headline. It's Trump's wild legal maneuvers... And that there's a bunch of words and it's faces astronomical odds. Okay. I would submit that in 1988, that would say Trump's legal process seems challenged or that it would be better than that. But, you know, the headlines now include wild astronomical odds. Um, This is a tough one. 
I don't want to have because any... why? Why wouldn't you just write something that talks about the fact that the, you know it's it's not a very good argument and the odds of it succeeding are limited? I think when you yeah, write I mean, wild, wild is a wild is a pretty values laden term. Um, what do you? It do? said flimsy a moment ago. Just it, like you wouldn't have seen a headline in in those days with no. those words. But in what it. do you'd you still, do? You well, get okay, the same let's meaning. Find, let's find a parallel. Um, What was something during the more moderate moment of media that was a crazy outlandish behavior and how was it reported? And when I'm, when I'm the parallel I'm drawing is I do believe the legal machinations right now, except for maybe one from the Trump camp are, well, they are factually very unusual. Many of them are there. They're a lot of smoke. Uh, a lot of what is it? A lot of bun no meat. Like they're salacious accusations, and then when you read the re- read the complaints, there's n- zero proffered evidence. Many of them don't even have the requisite filings to be moved through the system. They're just kind of like slaps across the face without the body blow, and that that's a fact. He's lost ten out yep. of ten cases. That's a fact. Um, there is one case that we've talked about. We should talk about again in Pennsylvania that he wants to get the Supreme Court that will not change the election outcome. And by the way, none of these cases will change the election outcome. And all of the cases, if he won them, wouldn't change the election outcome. These are all facts. So what are they? And what's a, what's a non-judgmental term? Are they, you know, I'll give you one, Tucker Carlson, who's effectively argued he's not going to win. He's now said, look, he's not going to win. We know that he's not going to win and we're going to have to accept that. But... We should pursue every case of electoral fraud. I'm on board with that. 100% on board with that. And I'd love to talk more about why. On the other hand, if you look at like Richard Grinnell or some of the people who are clearly just his spokespeople, kind of like people who are just simply trying to get, you know, likes and tweets and inflame the base or Donald Trump Jr. or Bannon. They're not. Uh, acknowledging that they're saying he's there's there's been a major lie here and then the election's been stolen from the American people and they're in some instances calling for armed revolution so you know this isn't just like oh there's a bunch of silly lawsuits this is to some extent the sanctity of the process is being called to question and the country is being held over the stove I don't know I don't I don't yeah the language is a little inflammatory I do I do think a very similar thought when I look at the New York Times headlines so they're, they're working very hard in their headline coverage of this situation to note that the president has lost and these legal machinations are not going to win and they're a bit of a distraction. But I, I look, how about this? We don't have the right media yet. We know that. It ain't CNN. It ain't Fox and MSNBC. It's not the op-ed section of the New York Times. You know, how would the Wall Street Journal cover that? I guess it'd be interesting. And I can look it up while we're talking. Like, what do they describe these things as? Well, so, so, and I don't know. And it would be a good thing. I mean, a moment ago it said flimsy. And I thought, well, that's just not a, you know, there's a way of saying it that is like old school objective is all I'm trying to say. And, and, and I'm going to add a layer here, which is I have a relatively scientific point of view, which I cannot share the science because I didn't write it down, but I came into contact with a lot of conservatives this summer who fit a description that's relatively similar to the woman who I spoke with yesterday. And I do not think those people are evil or bad. And I think if approached in a more productive way, including media and, uh, and lots of other things, that we'd have a better country, better culture. I think one of the ways to think about this is that what p- part might you play in helping this happen? And I think you've got to consider that whatever efforts you, as any one of us as an individual, is going to make or is going to be difficult. If it's easy, you might not be doing the right thing. So when the, in, when the inflammatory remark comes your way, pause and just ask yourself, oh, okay, my initial reaction would just say, oh, I hate the Republican senators. It's like, well, they highlighted one person who says inflammatory things. What are the other 49 doing? And what is their real point of view? 
And why might the media make that choice? And therefore, I'm going to make the more energy requiring thing, which is to say, you know, and I'm, I'm going to leave judgment for my own life experiences, which is that many of the people I come across in this vein are actually good people. Now, unfortunately, you, we, all of us have those loudmouths in our, in our social media feeds who are just examples of the extreme. In the meantime, most of us are like just hanging out, keeping our heads down, you know. And, you know, if, if you have, I'm making this up, if you have 500 friends on Facebook, are six of them annoying? Okay, well, that's a really low percentage. You know, how many of them actually sort of fit in the mold of like flamethrowers? Anyway, I, I could go on and on about this, but, I, but m the thing I try to do is when I, when I come across these moments, I say, all right, I'm just gonna work hard in this moment. And the hard working thing is to contemplate perhaps the good that sits within the midst of all of this. If I just take the bait, well, now I've just made things worse. And that's what I hope we don't do with this show. And, I, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm sure, by the way, that you and I have both taken the debate, the, taken the bait, and we've acted emotionally at certain times where maybe we're not helping as perhaps maybe we could or should. Now, there's been other times where we've acknowledged that um, we're choosing a route here because we are inflamed or we are, our logic has been stretched such that it, we would feel inhuman not to say this, that, or the other thing. Now, I'm sure there are people who are hearing that and would think like, oh, yeah, if it's in this category, Tom, that may be true. And I don't claim in any way to be perfect. I make a lot of mistakes in my life. Um, but that's kind of what I wanted to reexamine today and, and, and what I wanted to think about, because to me, we're in a new world now. I mean, hopefully, you know, the show started with we're way pre-election and here comes a big health problem. Through the course of it, that health problem grew. We had a race issue in America that became a big part of where the culture was moving over the summer and even now. But now, we, you know, it'll be interesting to see where that goes. I hope it goes to a good place, talking about the, the, the movement around race in America. There's going to be a new president. How will that unfold? And how might we come together and, quote, bridge a gap? And then last, and there will be more, but certainly among the, the top line things, are we now in a place with the coronavirus where we're, there's light at the end of the tunnel? Because for so long, it's been we're just in a quagmire. But maybe last week, maybe this week, it was this week, Monday, we began to start to see light. Now, if those things, if, if those things are going to carry forward, might we dedicate ourselves to helping people more clearly see the light so that we just don't jump in and act, you know, you know how the, the, the climber always dies on the way down the mountain? Well, if we're on the way down the mountain, let's just go down the mountain safely. Um, how might we help our culture heal, heal or, um, among other things around race, which is a very difficult one, but if we could make a small difference, wouldn't that be nice? And then broadly, politically speaking, do we just need to yell at each other all day long? Like, can't we like work with someone like Tristan Harris to understand what's coming at us both from traditional media and social media? And can we as a show help people understand those things so we can make better judgments and be, be better people in those moments as opposed to ourselves, because I fall to it too, just catching the flame that's thrown at me and making it bigger and throwing it back. Uh, imagery are you know first do no harm i think we've done a probably relatively okay job at not letting our personal biases dictate what we talk about and and i i'm pretty sure we haven't carried along any inflammatory or inaccurate news so that's that's a start we shouldn't give ourselves too much credit for not not eating the baby um then the question of I think, you know, trying to see the positive side, trying to understand, I think when you described your Eastern European friend earlier and, and you did a really good job of understanding the place where she comes from and even kind of got into her history, you know, being from Eastern Europe, very concerned about communists and communism and so socialism, as much as we can carry that forward, great. And we also, I think we also, I like how we're also able to be honest about things. So, so by not being partisan and not trying to score points and not trying to win and not being ego driven and not trying to inflame the flame ball and throwing it around uh, as goals, not saying we always hit it. Um, maybe that gives us room also to share some facts that might be contrary to some political opinion or the other, but just might be helpful to people. Like 
wearing a mask isn't going to hurt you and will help other people, regardless of what some political people want you to believe. Like that will forever and always be a great example. But yeah, I'm aligned, Tom. I think that's great. And, um, and, and where we can sort of take some steam out of the kettle. So one thing I, I suspect people would love to hear about today, if, if, and I'm not, not, not saying we have to do it right now, but at some point today, I want to talk about, you know, is Trump committing a coup and taking over the Department of Defense and putting all these loyalists in? It's another real. So uh, your Eastern European friend on one side has a very Trump point of view. A lot of other people on the other side have a very anti-Trump point of view, and they're very concerned about that. And I think we can assuage some of those fears today, too, as it was one topic we can use as a object lesson of what we've just discussed. Yeah. Well, part of what I had hoped to do today and we can move on is I just, you know, Dan and I spoke about this before today's show. Um, How might we talk about the show and its relationship to the world at large and how might that improve the show and how might that help the world at large? And that's really what I wanted to do. I don't want to be too meta. Nothing worse than spend a lot of time talking about yourself. So I apologize for doing that. But I also think it's like I it's I want to examine this. I want to try to be clear. I want to try to be helpful. You know, in the minute we start turning into TV people, I'm just not interested. <laughs> it sounds miserable and we have, to me. You know, we this sounds so corny. I don't know why I'm I don't know why I'm possibly resistant to saying this, but we have there's a number of there's a lot of people I've never met who I hope to meet, who have given such great advice and commentary and insight to our conversations over social media or other ways. And this feels so cheesy, but I'm really excited to hear what they have to think about what we're saying here. Yeah. Well, I I mean, I won't use the name, but yeah, I won't use the name, but I, you know, I, I, there's a media guy who is a big media guy in politics and I've probably mentioned his name before, but I'm, whatever, I'm just, I don't know why I'm not doing it now. But the bottom line is that the more divisive he can be, and he will say this. No, you, you'd say it. He was on your stage. Um, yeah. Well, Glenn Beck, Glenn but that, Beck. but now there's another one, but, but there's now another one who's become a big deal. And I spoke to his father-in-law this morning and I just don't want to, anyway, um, It's very tempting to walk into this trap. And if you think that Rachel Maddow doesn't have this same set of demands, you're missing something. I'm not judging her per se, but when she really makes the Republicans look bad, when she says something really hardcore, her ratings go up. She makes more money. She becomes more popular. It's just true. And in our tiny little way, if we can fight through that, Maybe we can be more helpful to people, but but here's the thing: it's therefore it's never going to be that salacious. It's never go, it's always going to be a little vanilla what we're doing. Well, here. we talked about today, men- we talked about Charles Kuralt. I mean, we're yeah. not we're not quite there. There's plenty of great people who get to spend a lot of time with smart folks like you and I get to do that historically that haven't been. Look at HR McMaster. That conversation with HR, right? You know, he could have been. He could have made so much more money. He could have sold so many expensive speaking engagements if he came out and just took the lead everybody wanted him to take, which was come out and say I'm the president. Because you know, you were in the room. You can tell us all sorts of stories. Come out and do that. And, and as I said, when we went into that conversation with him, I was kind of keen to get him to do that too. And I kind of fooled myself since he and I are friends, maybe he would show more leg in that direction. And that would be interesting for our viewers. And that would be, you know, viral and this and that. Like, and, and as I was preparing, I watched more and more what he would say on this topic. And I realized a shitty goal for me to have and B no way it's going to happen. And it didn't. And instead I learned a ton about just, I don't know, moderation, patience, um, faith in the system, um, not giving into that, the devil on your left shoulder, which is so much of what media does. And, 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 and by the end, look, you spent an hour in that interview we had with him. If you went into it with the view that I just described that I had, you're no way you're leaving that interview feeling that way. It took an hour and it took an unbelievable communicator who wrote a brilliant book, uh, and, uh, HR to, to describe that, but it worked. Yeah. Well, those, yeah. I, I mean, there's a woman named Ken Rhea Rankin who I had a conversation with her. She wrote a book called, um, 
how to fight white supremacy. And it was a similar kind of conversation. And, and it was, um, and I just take so much away from that. But in the individual moment, it's not as good as like a, uh, what's the guy, a Aaron Sorkin film. It's just not. Like, that's not what's happening. That's not the appeal. There's a different kind of an appeal. So anyway, I hope we stick to that. I do want to, by the way, get this, because there's two things I want to like. To, I'd love to hear your latest thoughts on the election, but also just an updated view, if you could, on the Monday news and any other kind of corona news that you might be able to share. Well, we got to do corona. Able to share. Uh, and, and, like, just remember... Um, you know, on Monday, why don't we have a conversation about Corona in my house, which I'm not going to do till Monday. But punchline there is, please realize you can work for 248 days, which is about how long we've been in lockdown, and be unbelievably careful. And one simple slip up, and all of a sudden it's in your house with an infected person. And, um, and the endemic disease, meaning the amount of disease that's flowing around from person to person right now in this country has never been higher. There is more corona in America by a mile than there ever has been. It's growing, as viruses do, exponentially. We had 1,400 people die yesterday. Like, it's all just bad news. And there's no good news on the growth of the disease right now. And... Um, we are smarter. We know to wash hands and wear masks and socially distance. That might mean we can have a little more social interaction. Than we did during that first kind of clumsy panicked March, but it's out. It's, it's really widespread. Please be very careful. Uh, the disease, the disease growth news is nothing, nothing but bad. There are two pieces of good news. We talked about one on Monday, which was the Pfizer vaccine announcement. And, and it's, we don't have new news there, but it's very positive. 90% immunogenic. If you take this vaccine, 90% likely you will have conferred immunity. You will be immune from the disease. And I guess what we maybe kind of know is that's new. The immunity might last longer than, for example, the Chinese vaccine, which appears to last less than six months. Or the conferred immunity you get by getting sick appears to last less, six months a year. This may have a longer immunogenic activity. That's very positive. Can you take a, just a guess at what that length of time is? It would be useless for me to give okay. a guess. Um, okay, so it's conceivable then that we may have to get our annual yes, corona oh yes, shot for some time. And yeah. remember that the Johnson & Johnson vaccines and others that are coming a little later may even be better both to the uh, percent effective and the length of effectiveness, the immunogenicity and the, and the longevity. So that's super good news. Other good news is Eli Lilly has a monoclonal antibody treatment that just got emergency use authorization, which is great. Um, this is similar to the Regeneron product that the president got when he got ill. Um, so that's very good news. Both those products really could be very useful products. They're extremely expensive and they're, they're in very low production. The Regeneron product is only a compassionate use authorization, meaning someone has to be in really dire straits. And then if you're lucky, blah, blah, blah. So don't expect that you're going to get Regeneron. Eli Lilly is now one step ahead. But again, manufacturing is slow. So that's good news. Um, I'm sure there's other you know, therapeutics and vaccines continue to do well. So that's where we are on the disease. How's distribution on the, on the vaccine? What, Thank do you, you know any more about yeah, that? It's, it's good. Um, it's not, it's good. You know, I think we expect 10 million doses by the end of the year or close distributed and used. Remember that you have to be in the super cold chain for this to work, which is kind of novel and hard. Um, you do need a booster. And would there be, would that chain reach the, the rural chain, America? It'll, it'll reach anywhere, but it's going to be expensive and hard. So rural America is going to be. I mean, you can drive it 500 miles from, you know, you can just put it in a, in a, in a cold container. Um, but it, that's harder. And, and it, it, what, what I guess the cost will be one, it will actually cost dollars to build the cold receiving facilities and the cold shipment facilities. And that's real, real money. That's expensive stuff. You know, redesigning super cold supply chain lines, that's real money. And we're going to have to do that. And by the way, it's not going to be useful for anything else in the future either. So it's going to be a one-time sunk cost. 
The second expense is then you have to be able to receive it at your hospital. That's expensive. And it's not just a fridge. It's not just a freezer. It's like a super cold environment. So that's expensive. Um, you know, but we got to do it. And then if you now you take that and you lay it over to to Africa or poor countries, big trouble. The good news is a lot of poor Americans, certainly not all, live in cities in America. So cities are easier for the supply chain. But rural America, it's just going to be harder, more expensive to get there. I don't know who's in charge of building the supply chain out into rural America, but let's let's I don't know. I wish I could tell you this group's in charge of it. They got this much money. They're doing it. Let's hope that's underway. Yeah. OK, on to the president and the president elect. What do you see there? Um, I have a different view today than I did yesterday. So yesterday, my view was. My view right now, the way I'm structuring this is the president, the, the, it's, it's impossible for the president to win now. Like, and yesterday my view was he has to hit three in the park, grand slam home runs in the last at bat or the last three at bats to win. Meaning there's, there's a chance, but unbelievably slim. I don't think that chance exists anymore because the Arizona numbers, the Georgia numbers are, are pretty heavy. What he's done is file a bunch of lawsuits that are going after 100 votes here, 1,000 votes there. They've all been dismissed. 10 out of 10 are dismissed. He's put up different people as evidence who not only have been dismissed, but they're going to go to jail, right? So he put up a postal inspector as evidence, excuse me, a postal employee as evidence of fraud in Philadelphia. That person has since admitted he took $130,000 um, bribe to lie. He's going to go to jail for that. So what evidence they have brought forward has been embarrassingly bad or non-existent. I'm trying not to fall into the word flimsy and this and that. Um, those cases aren't going to win. There's a Supreme Court case that the Supreme Court will now hear. The 6-3 Supreme Court wants to hear it. Alito is the, the local. He, he owns that circuit. It's Philadelphia Supreme. Sorry. It's a Pennsylvania court case. Prepare to hear that the Supreme Court accepted a case. Prepare to hear the, the smaller and smaller number of people on Trump's side who say that he could win. Trumpet that very loudly. Prepare to hear, prepare to feel a lot of panic. Oh my God, the Supreme Court's actually taking a case about the election. Huh, we're going to lose or he's going he's gonna to win. Those things aren't real. Um, I won't get into the legalities of this case, but it will, it will not change the election. Now, it could create enough smoke and gaslighting that you now run into this risk of some Republican legislature sending forward their own electoral slate against the will of the people they were elected to serve. I am not confident yet that that's not a risk. What do I mean? What I mean is Pennsylvania has got Republican legislators. The Constitution says the legislators send forward the slate of electors to the federal government. You technically don't even have to let the people vote in every state. The, the, the legislature can just send the electors ahead on their own. There's two parts of the Constitution that deal with this. One of them does say you have to figure out that modality on you know, the, the November date, the election, the election, election date. Um, they didn't. Um, so that my great experts tell me, don't worry, because the Constitution would prevent them now from sending forward a slate of electors different than the one voted by the citizenry. I'm not sold on that yet. So watch this space. You know, brilliant Supreme Court justice, Supreme Supreme Court minds tell me, RP, nope, not an issue. So that's kind of where we are in this. And then, t Tom, you get to this question, the transition, the DOD firings, the DOE firings. And, you know, we should talk about that for a second. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's so I watched um, the Comey rule on Showtime. Um, and listen, I, I've been around, I've been around long enough that a film can take any perspective it, it would like to, right? Um, I don't know the actor who played Trump, but he's good. Yeah, it's like, entertaining. Shy, I mean, it, entertaining, and it's not easy to play Donald Trump. I thought he was good. Um, it's one, it's a page turner. Like I want to know the next thing and the next thing and the next thing, and I enjoyed it. And my takeaway was. You know, it, Comey's, Comey has supporters and detractors in, in interesting places on all sides, you know. 
um, a lot of the film is from the point of view of Jim Comey. Um, what I take away is if you just think like, did this part happen or did that part happen, regardless of what you think the, the take is on the language in each case, it's pretty messy. Like there's a lot of things that the government has been doing in the last four years that are way outside the norm of regular procedure. Just as an example, you know, the, the Justice Department is or the FBI is part of the Justice Department. And at the time, Jeff Sessions, who was the boss of Jim Comey, really should have been the one who was interacting um, in the middle of like the Michael Flynn and all these other things. I don't want to bore you with the details. Here's why I'm bringing it up. What's happening right now at the DOD feels very scary to me. Like it doesn't seem like just after the election for a lame duck to replace the Secretary of Defense. Like that just seems like very strange timing to me. Tell me what you th- tell me what you know. Just quickly want to comment on this. I think I think you kind of hit the phrase way outside the norm. Way outside the norm. There's been so much of this presidency that's way outside the norm. At some point we discussed that actually a ton of what happens in the executive branch and it turns out in other branches is not based on law or even regulation, but on precedent and behavior and manners. And so this guy, this president, was able to go in and change so much of, of the way we interact with the government and the government interacts with us without even touching law or regulation, but just by precedent and manners. And of course, he then did a lot on regulation and then allow a law on law. Just, as a, just want to make sure I touch that point. Way outside the norm. So when you have someone who's way outside the norm, when you have a campaign as the beginning of the Comey rule shows up with a ton of Russian conversations going on, whatever, if they were nefarious or not, all sorts of conversations going on with known Russian intelligence officers. Like this happened. George Papadopoulos was talking with a known FSB officer who has since disappeared. Like fact. And you're the FBI. That's way outside the norm. And your response thereby is going to be way outside the norm. When you have a president who fires his secretary of defense right after he loses an election, that's way outside the norm. So I guess I want to make sure we can have these conversations about behaviors that are way outside the norm while we hold the precedent of 1970s Walter Cronkite inside the norm, you know, journalistic language. Hard to do. Um, <laughs> I don't know exactly what's going on in the DOD. I'm not worried. Um, the Yes, the people he's put in those positions are absolute diehard lockstep goose stepping Trumpites. Now, see, I just said goose stepping. That was a wrong term. <laughs> so, <laughs> they, that, I don't want to put too many restrictions on you. <laughs> but they are, uh, they are, these are, these are Trump all day people. Um, and you could look at that. So if this was happening overseas, if this was happening in Russia, I'd be like, holy, what's going on? You know, what do they have planned, right? Um, I'm not nervous about it. I think there might be some score settling. I think there might be some quick promotion title grabbing, you know, Hey, look, I was under secretary of defense. I was secretary of defense. Well, okay. You know, um, I think there might be some, um, I think by the president, I don't think there's a grand plan right now in anything. I don't think there's a grand plan in winning the election. I don't think there's a grand plan in overtaking DOD. I don't think there's a grand plan in shipping weapons to this country or that country or invading this country or that country. I think there's a bunch of, I honestly think that there's a man, the president who, is having a very hard time accepting that he lost. I think he's very afraid of what comes next. I think his whole life he's, he's been beaten into him by his dad, that losers are the worst thing in the world. Now he is one. I think that his response, as we probably talked early on my math, my model for his go-to behavior. And this is, I mean, (laughs) everything we said today, Tom, I'm just going to throw it on the floor and piss on it. What my, my model on his, the way he, his first instinct to thinks to things is that of a fifth grade bully and a fifth grade bully right now is taking his ball and going home. Fine. If you're going to do this to me, then I'm going to take my ball and go home and I'm going to just, you know, screw up a bunch of stuff in the way. I don't think there's a grand plan. Is there a big arms shipment going to the UAE? Is there a big arms shipment going to Taiwan? I don't know. Those things require so much approval by so many levels. By the way, I wouldn't mind either of those things at all. In fact, there's this rumor about a Taiwan arms shipment. It'd be great if he did that. It'd make things a lot easier for Biden because then Biden would say, I am sorry, I didn't do it. Doesn't have to piss off Beijing. It can negotiate with him. And Taiwan will be more armed like we'd like. You know, but I've never, I haven't heard anything nefarious. There was a, I know, for example, I'm not going to mention her name, but a senior executive was fired from a senior job 
and it's been bundled into this you know, Trump's firing senior people thing. That was an internal score settling thing that wasn't even Trump. It was someone, a, a, a major person fired a second level major person, claimed the president did it. I happen to know president didn't even know what happened, actually likes this woman who got fired, but that that person's boss just used the fog of what's going on now, grabs him at the White House to say, we got to get rid of her and, and send an announcement out. And all of a sudden this very senior, very expert, uh, pretty steady hand just lost her job in a really senior role. And you could look at that and be like, oh my God, panic, panic. No, it was effectively a, the jerky boss trying to get rid of her and using the fog of uncertainty to do so. So I'm not too concerned about all those jobs and uh, people moving around. I, I think of it less as a grand plan, more as, you know, the kid taking his ball from the playground and going home and kicking over a couple Lego pieces and sandboxes in the way. Yeah. Sand castles. Yeah. Um, you would know that better than I. I. It's a little creepy. But, it's scary. Um, it's way outside yeah. the norm. <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, there were some moments in that film. I mean, I, I've worked around people like him, like what it seems Donald Trump might be like. And weird shit happens. Like you kind of never know what's coming next. And, and, and it's very hard. You know, there's certain people who like are really selfless in setting an agenda and keeping a team on an agenda. And then there's other people where the agenda is all about them. And the way that, you know, it would be surprising to me that that Rod Rose, Rosenstein memo on the firing of Comey. Like if that guy's like somewhat professional, he would never have written that memo. You know, in the memo, it says James Comey, who has already said three times that you are not under investigation, is someone we should fire. <laughs> like, like who writes that letter? Rod there's, Rosenstein, there's really not many explanations a, for that. He's a fascinating personality in this whole drama. He's like the Shakespearean secondary character who you just never quite get a feel for. Um, you know, his sister is one of the greatest public health officials in the U.S. government. Is that right? Yep. And she's one of the first people who, who waved the flag on Corona. And she got put in a box for it. If I, if, I hope I'm not conflating her with someone else. She's clearly a very senior PHH official. And I think she is that one, one I'm describing. I don't, you know, the movie describes him as a sycophant follower who gets pushed by the breeze, rises up to this huge position, perfect example of the Peter Principle, and then falls under some pressure to the president to write that ridiculous memo and fires his mentor, you know, Comey, with the memo. Um, I don't have any reason to disagree with that. Um, from disagree I with that. I think that seems theory? like a fair, a pretty fair characterization, but it's terrifying. You know, the deputy U S attorney general is, is someone who's that flaccid. Uh, wow. Yeah. And if, and if you just look at the memo, you don't even have to know anything about the law. You just wouldn't imagine that that memo gets written, you know? And, and it's amazing the power, like, it, like all of a sudden, you know how many people would have probably told him not to fire Mattis? And he fired Mattis. I think we, I think we have to accept something. I think when, when this conversation plus way outside the norm, did, were you going to say something? I was, did Mattis resign? Because I might have gotten that wrong. Um, Mattis resigned because, yes, Mattis resigned because the president. Yeah, sorry, I got that wrong. Mattis resigned because the president um, did something with. Syria. It was some policy behavior by the president that made Mattis resign. Yeah. Um, so anyway, go back to what you were saying. We, we look our entire lives until four years ago, the president, the presidency, the White House, to some extent, the government w was a place that we were told to hold in reverence and a place me big time having worked there and been in government, you know, and someday I'll tell the story about the first time I sat in the Oval Office of the president and, 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 and I walked out and I was like, I couldn't even stand up and, and um, because of the reverence for the position and the people. And, and so I have it, I have it in a big way. And I think America has, has some degree of that too. And, and so we presume we, we really kind of go into it to some, many of us with best presuming best intentions, right? Presuming competence, presuming there's a plan, presuming they know things we don't know, presuming that there's rules holding people in check, presuming that there's a bunch of adults at the table. And, when that's not the case, um, the surprise, the shock, the disbelief, and then the denial is so powerful. And we're still 
doing it. We still look at him firing a bunch of people, moving a bunch of people around the Department of Defense and go, ooh, there's a grand plan. There's not. And we look at his lawsuits and go, oh, there's still actually a case here. There's, there's really something going on. Even me, oh, there's still some case. Maybe there's, there's not. You know, there's the, 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 so the people that have risen to many positions of power in this administration are so out of their depth. Um, and, and the ones who are left now are so out of their depth. The people who are falling off the bandwagon every day who were previously said, look, let him run out these cases. Let him try to win more and more are coming back and saying, stop it. Come on. We're done. We're paying a cost now. And here's the cost, Tom. I'm not so, oh, the transition, now nah, they'll fine. The Biden's transition is going to be great. Unbelievably talented group of people. Love or hate the policies. These guys know what they want to do. By the way, if you're terrified of Biden, be more terrified because these are super competent folks, but don't be. Um, I'm not worried about the days lost in the transition. I think, I think the Republicans have a very good argument that it took 37 days to finish Bush v. Gore before the transition. Uh, okay. Now, um, I think what, I'm concerned about is 70% of Republicans in a recent poll. So that's a third of America. 70% of Republicans said they do not believe this is a free and fair election. 70% of Americans are saying, I have massive skepticism about my government. That sucks. That's the cost. That's the cost of when behaviors are way outside the norm, pushed towards telling lies to people and, and, building and breeding this um, cynicism and lack of trust in our own government. That's very dangerous. So that's the cost. All right. We're out of time. Um, I totally broke our promise. We started off by saying we weren't going to be value laden and then look at me, but we're, we're, we'll get there next time. Well, as long as we, as long as we check ourselves um, and I hope, you know, I hope we find, we're going to have to work towards it. You know, it happened over time and it's going to heal over time. It's just sort of the nature of these things.